and welcome once again to Father Spitzer's Universe at the busy intersection where faith and reason meets each week and we get to see you as well. I'm Doug Keck, the gatekeeper. Email your questions to Father Spitzer's Universe at EW10.com as it says on the screen. Check out all of Father Spitzer's websites as well, Magis Center, Credible Catholic, Purposeful Universe as well. Each different, each insightful. And of course, Father Spitzer's Universe is always available on the EW10 On Demand page and also on our EWTN YouTube channel. So if you missed it, or you'd like to watch another section of it again, uh, try and take in what Father just said, that would be great. It helps you out. We also have a lot of devotionals on demand. You know, we recently added the International Rosary and the Rosary with our own MFVA Fathers, so you can pray with them any time of the day or night. And we know how important devotionals are to the maintenance of the, this network in the sense of what's important to people along with the Mass, of course. Absolutely, Mother Angelica, she knew what she was doing. And we're going to talk about Satan customizing his temptations. That's from Father's book, Christ versus Satan in Our Daily Lives, naturally available through our religious catalog, as is, of course, our book of the month by our good friend, Father Brian Malady, host of Open Line Thursday, and at St. Thomas Aquinas Rescues Modern psychology, like I say, rescues that I think from Father, from Dr. Ray there on the radio show, they can compete. <laughs> but there's only one Father Spitzer, so let's get to him and kick things off, Father, with a with a, a prayer. Okay? Absolutely. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your many blessings to us, especially the blessing of this ministry, our ability to serve in it. Please send your Holy Spirit down upon us this day, Doug, myself, our whole audience, so that everything we do and say will be brought to fruition in your will for the good of your people, your church, and your kingdom. We ask all of these things through Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. And Mary, seat of wisdom, pray Amen. for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Great to see you, Father. Hope everything's okay. Yeah, well, everything's great. <laughs> well, this week uh, you actually have the Napa event happening, right? And uh, That's right. And uh, so you get to do several talks. Uh, you're the MC, right, for that event? That's right. I'm the MC and uh, talking on uh, science at the doorstep of God, science at the doorstep of Mary, and science at the doorstep of the Holy Eucharist. So we've got uh, three different talks there. So uh, it uh, should be a lot of fun. Right, a lot of doorsteps. So that's great. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's right. We used to call them stoops uh, when I grew up in New York. Yeah. But anyway, uh, so let's get to some uh, questions. Uh, but before sure. we get to that, we've got some articles I want you to respond to. As we sure. talked about with the changes in abortion and, and, and much of the noise that's out there and gibberish that's out there, it's interesting to see how, and I think you talked about it a while ago, the idea that with the change in the law, uh, it really has changed the discussion, and so you're finding, as this article from The Federalist says, uh, 10 proofs that the left is not pro-choice but pro-abortion. Uh, you know, kind of the mask yeah. is off. Uh, and, yeah. and like they say here, and this is one of the number one things, the left wants government to shut down pro-life pregnancy centers. They complain, as Elizabeth yeah. Warren did, about the fact that we don't do enough for these women who are pregnant. We don't care. But yet, there's yeah. all these pregnancy centers, and even she said there's substantially more pro-life pregnancy centers in Massachusetts than there are abortion mills. Yeah, that's right. In fact, I think it's uh, nationwide, it's mm -hmm. about five times more uh, um, uh, pregnancy centers, or maybe four times more pregnancy mm -hmm. centers uh, than uh, abortion uh, mills. And so, uh, yes, uh, definitely um, um, she's right. And uh, uh, what's wrong with having choice, as, you, mm -hmm. as the article suggests? <laughs> right. I mean, sh shutting down the very possibility of expressing another opinion is hardly pro choice. So right. uh, uh, I think uh, right. the, the Federalist article is right on the marker. And the next one, uh, I'll jump around, but this one was the left frame support for women as anti-choice campaign. I didn't know this story. Apparently, it says when the diocese, Catholic diocese of Belleville in Illinois, recently decided to sell the historic home that it housed its bishop to donate the proceeds to a maternity fund, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch framed the sale as pro-lifers opposing women's rights, saying right in its headline <laughs> that the diocese would use the cash for anti-abortion battle. Can you make this stuff up? 
<laughs> that is so radically uh, biased. I mean, it's right out of Russia. Right. I expect to find that article in Pravda. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> I mean, uh, or the Chinese national uh, paper. I love it. <laughs> I mean, Absolutely. This is so made up. I mean, it's science fiction at its best. I mean, this is Newspeak at its best. I love it. And this is called journalism. Right. Oh my gosh, we're back to uh, uh, back to 1984. I love it. Absolutely. <laughs> Another one they talked about that the and this is something we talked about on the show a couple of weeks ago. The left calls losing a baby an abortion. They're wrongly, wrongly, uh, wrongly calling the treatment of ectopic pregnancies and miscarriages like they're abortions. Yeah, I know. This is the uh, the next uh, infamy. I mean, that you're going to basically uh, equate the two things as if the voluntary nature of an abortion has nothing to do with the definition of the act. I mean, holy mm. mackerel. I mean, uh, that's just like saying, well, you know, um, um, an accidental uh, uh, a killing is the same as murder. Uh, I mean, uh, because intention has nothing to do with it. You know? right. So why even bother to introduce uh, the difference between negligent homicide uh, and uh, and murder into the law? I mean, uh, the foolishness of it all. It's right. all just one of a piece. Right. I mean, the the ill logic, uh, the craziness of 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 this kind of uh, reductio ad absurdum mm -hmm. uh, just has to you know bring to light the bankruptcy of the arguments that uh, our opponents are right. making I mean they're, they're totally it's not just sophistical they're, they're bankrupt altogether they're filled with contradiction it's like telling Jesus that he's casting out demons by the power of demons right. I mean it's a self-contradiction so anyway uh, uh, what can I say except right. uh, people well, will say what they're gonna say and if they think they can get away with outrageous contradictions outrageous lies, outrageous Pravda-like recharacterizations right. of a charitable action, well, then, you this know, is, people uh, are gullible enough, that's what is, they want, you know, that's, that's what they're going to get. Gullible Gerbilism. We've got Gerbils all yeah. over here. The bigger yeah. the lie you tell, the better all, and the more often you repeat it, yeah. the more people believe it, right? Absolutely, yeah. Wow. That was the, the great Goebbels, who was the propaganda artist for Hitler, uh, who uh, espoused that fine principle. Right. Also, <laughs> they say pro aborts claim that abortion saves lives, and they're propagating the idea that women, <laughs> that women with life-threatening pregnancy complications will die unless they get an abortion. But the facts say otherwise. The pro-life OBGYNs have attested it's ne never necessary to perform an abortion to save a mother's life. Yeah, I mean, they're in. A, I mean, that's a double lie, uh, because of mm -hmm. course the first thing is, is uh, you know, the characterization of abortion is not taking a human life. I mean, the science dictates mm -hmm. it's it's a human life. The medicine dictates it's a human life, and people in their consciences know it's a human life. Uh, this, the idea that uh, abortion is saving lives, and then of course to to mischaracterize uh, women's uh, difficulties in in pregnancy and to say that uh, uh, if uh, abortion is not uh, required that you're going to lose the life of a mother that hasn't happened for the last 20 years so or maybe the last 15 mm -hmm. years anyway right. so I mean uh, again you know it's just complete fast and loose with the facts and uh, right. and no no care and at it, all about not only the facts but the intrinsic contradictions right. and the utterances and as it's you amazing. and as you talked about uh, on one of our prior shows, the idea of double effect. You know, if, if yeah. that's really the case, one can go and yeah. do whatever it takes to try and save the mother's life without the intentionality yeah. of, of having of the fetus or the child yeah. die, but, you know, of the, course. as you explained it, right? Yeah, and, and, and you know, here's, I mean, we could actually do a comedy routine mm -hmm. on this, Doug. Mm -hmm. I mean, with all these um, uh, recharacterizations of, of the obvious in terms of the uh, uh, not only highly unlikely, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, totally false. I mean, it, it's, it's hilarious, really. I mean, uh, uh, that people are so uncritical that they could actually buy this. <laughs> I mean, it's right. Well, a, it's because, uh, well, a lot of these people, I, I think, do you think, and I'll pose it to you, do you think a lot of it's just, you know, uh, you know, I want this to be true uh, for whatever particular reason, whether I feel culturally or I have guilt about it or whatever, 
And so I just throw whatever I have to at the wall yeah. to, to dismiss. And after you rebut all of these things, then we turn out that you're, you know, you hate women or you're a racist or something else. Then, then the ad hominem yeah. attacks come on. Uh, oh, yeah. No, I think it really is the spaghetti against the wall. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, honestly, if you d don't have a good argument, uh, then you're kind of reduced to a bad argument. If your bad argument is so ridiculous that it's funny, mm -hmm. uh, then, of course, you have to go to the ad hominem uh, because uh, that's the only thing left yeah. of you. You know all these people are just rotten uh, people. And so mm -hmm. you can, you know, those pro-lifers who are out there, uh, uh, trying to really sacrifice of themselves to mm -hmm. save the lives of these preborn ch right. children. Yeah, they're they're a bunch of rotten bums. Right. You know, and we, we really believe you. We really believe you. Right. And the final one here, uh, the left treats abortion like it has no consequences. What they leave out is studies that show the rate of suicide for women who have had abortions is about double compared to those who gave birth. Uh, and also abortions are associated with higher risk of mental illness than for women who've not had abortions, let alone talking about grief, guilt, et cetera. Yeah, this Priscilla Coleman, by the way, that those statistics are pretty darn uh, right on. Mm -hmm. uh, Priscilla Coleman uh, wrote that huge study with three quarters of a million women uh, involved in, in the study for the Cambridge uh, uh, website and for the British Journal of Psychiatry. Mm -hmm. And she found that there was an 81 percent greater chance of having uh, some significant um, mental uh, difficulty, uh, psychological difficulty, emotional difficulty uh, going forward in the future if you've had an abortion than if you did not have an mm -hmm. abortion. That is to say, you, d you brought the, the child to, t uh, to a term and um, or you um, didn't uh, ha or not pregnant at all. So when you compare the statistics, and I think, it, by the way, if I'm not mistaken, it's mm -hmm. four times higher uh, rate of, um, after an abortion, four times higher rate of suicide, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a two times higher rate of suicidal ideation. Now, I know, or maybe 2.5 times higher rate of suicidal ideation. And uh, the statistics, too, about substance mm -hmm. abuse, that's correct. I think um, it's uh, double uh, for substance abuse if you've had an abortion and um, you have a significant rise in depression, anxiety right. uh, statistics as well. One way or the other, it's not good. Uh, that's what the bottom it's line not good. is. Uh, it's not good. Abortion is not good. No. Right. So they, they do leave all of that out, yes. Right, absolutely. Uh, another uh, thing that's out there and playing around, this came from uh, something that the Catholic League, uh, Bill Donahue, put out about the World Health mm -hmm. Officials, he just called the, the goal of them. The World Health Organization has released its updated manual on gender mainstreaming for health managers. Who officials boast that they now have, quote, unquote, new gender equity and human rights framework and tools that will enable them to counter gender discrimination in related issues. The new features go, quote unquote, beyond non-binary approaches to gender and health to recognize gender and sexual diversity or the concepts that gender identity exists on a continuum and that sex is not limited to male or female. Well, I'm not surprised. I mean, it is another uh, bureaucracy, and uh, um, it is another uh, bureaucracy that's controlled by mainstream bureaucracies in mm -hmm. Europe and uh, and um, in the United States. And Europe and the United States uh, have reflected this already. Mm -hmm. uh, why wouldn't they follow suit? Right. Uh, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm not surprised. I think they're wrong. Mm -hmm. I, I think um, it, we've looked at the statistics that uh, for emotional health before, that if you get a sex change, um, you know, when uh, uh, you know you still have these uh, difficult uh, emotional uh, problems uh, underlying, mm. uh, you know, the desire for the sex change, and you just get a sex change without any therapeutic counseling, uh, yeah, you've got a 19 times higher rate uh, of suicide. And in Sweden, uh, which is, um, you know, transgender friendly for sure, mm -hmm. um, uh, in Sweden you, you definitely have a 20 times increase in suicides after, after the uh, 
um, the um, the surgery has been done. Right. So, um, but, I mean, we're talking right. 20 times now, not 20 percent. We're talking about 20 and as you, times, 10, and as you pointed, percent. And as you pointed out, <laughs> that's in a culture that's accepting, because a lot of the arguments come, well, it's because these people aren't accepted. That's yeah. why they have these problems. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, uh, it's uh, the Swedish culture very accepting of transgender, so mm -hmm. the problem is probably not cultural acceptance at all. It mm -hmm. may play a factor, but it's mm -hmm. not going to be a significant factor. I think that the, the true factors are, uh, as I have said before, if you, uh, mm -hmm. you know, 60% of, of these people have definite anxiety in the household that a child will blame themselves for, another 50% uh, of those uh, people have been um, uh, abused uh, mm -hmm. uh, physically or sexually as children and of course you have another uh, large uh, group of, of individuals mm -hmm. who have latent homosexual uh, desires uh, but then when you compound them with the anxiety in the household you compound it uh, with the um, uh, you know a, a potential of sexual abuse you put all the things together and you've got one very high anxiety person mm -hmm. who thinks uh, mistakenly that the solution of the problem is getting a sex change or that the parents right. want well, would have rather had a girl than a boy etc cetera, etc cetera, and that the solution is uh, to all my uh, feelings to my anxieties I just get the sex change and all will be better well it is better for the first few years it no question the person feels a sense of relief and then 10 years down the pike bammo 20 times increase mm -hmm. in suicides so um, like, yeah right. then when the buyer's remorse hits then when the reality that's not being told to you by the medical community that's not being told to you uh, by the culture of what might be likely if you go through with this of the anxieties that do need to be dealt with and if they don't mm -hmm. dealt with they're just going to get worse three years after the surgery that's not being and we're said. seeing and we're, it's dis and yeah. I think we're starting to see some of that buyer's remorse now yeah. uh, out yeah. there and and being publicized more of what's that yeah it's been out there but it got kind of tamped down we don't we, you know we can't yeah. promote that because it's uh, it's not good for the yeah. cause of course it would be good yeah. if maybe the World Health Organization could figure out where COVID came from that would probably be helpful yeah. <laughs> uh, you know yeah. and since they can't seem to figure out <clears throat> uh, where the lab was located uh, so yeah. anyway uh, and one more uh, thing tying into our topic having to do with Satan and other things you've talked yeah. about in one of the earlier chapters we were in uh, it's, it's a story about modern-day witches uh, that the register or people that the register did uh, it oh, talks okay. about uh, uh, about a father Patrick uh, and, and it was talking about modern day witches, uh, and mm -hmm. it was in the Daily Beast. A gala darling, I guess that's her name, who identifies as a witch, it is the author of Radical Self Love. Boy, does that fit. Uh, was featured yeah. in the article. She proudly proclaims that she casts spells on Donald Trump and is part of a host of feminists and female celebrities who practice witchcraft. She goes on to say that last February, Darling helped to orchestrate binding spells to prevent Donald Trump and his administration from doing harm. Uh, and in the article it says, when Darling fails to understand is that her spell has worked but according to the devil's plans, not her. Father Patton explained that spells accomplish what the devil hopes for, a relationship that is not easy to escape from. Yeah, in chapter three of my book, there, right. Christ versus Satan, I talk about this explicitly. Um, and by the way, when you cast spells and you cooperate with Satan and with Satan's plan, mm. just remember God can first counteract that plan. Um, and so uh, uh, you might uh, say, I have a binding spell on so and so, yet at the same time, if so and so has faith, uh, he, through his prayer, is already calling in to action the um, Holy Spirit to counteract what's going mm -hmm. on there and the Holy Spirit and God are going to protect people in accordance with the faith they have and with the uh, um, the, the practice of mm -hmm. their religious faith that they have and so if a person is going uh, to let's say confession or going to uh, Holy Communion frequently they're praying I mean that spell is going to have as much effect as you know uh, right. uh, throwing literally water against a, 
a 20-foot wall. So it's not going to do anything. Uh, you know, it, it okay. really depends on the state of the person. Um, you know, that's being uh, uh, that spell is being cast on. But the second dimension of spells mm. is they affect the person who is casting them. Mm. So you, the more you cooperate with Satan, the more you use his power, the more you subject yourself to his to his influence, the more you bring yourself under his subjugation. And don't worry, he'll take advantage of this when the time comes, and you're going to have to pay the price. Or I'm telling you, if you want right. to break the, uh, you know, your subjugation. And you're going to have to freely renounce him. And just try that when you're way down the path. Right, it's right. going to be tough. And if you do try it when you're way down the path, and you really do, and you um, you know, turn to the Lord and, and ask for his, uh, his help, and you follow through with it, uh, by the way, with, uh, if, you, if you're Catholic with sacramental confession, etc., and you follow through with this, uh, it, it'll be hard. Mm -hmm. But uh, Christ will protect you and bring you back in, but it'll be hard. And right. the further down you get and the more you put yourself under the subjugation of Satan, don't worry. He's going to try and make you pay the bill. Christ, of course, at the end of the day has paid the, the, the price for all of us, but we must freely turn to him and ask right. for his mercy, and we must freely follow through on that. Otherwise, uh, Satan will be back. Right. You can be sure with his many minions to Absolutely. bring you back to quote unquote where you belong. Well, you either read this article or you're very prescient. Here's the next thing I was going to say. You're becoming indebted by calling on power, not from God, and establish a relationship with the mm -hmm. power. If you ask a favor, these spirits don't want to help you in the long run. If you think they do, you're fooling their, yourself. Like a stalker, yeah. uh, the devil doesn't want people to walk away from him. Evil is not concerned yep. about your freedom and wants control. It is God who wants you to have true freedom. And then he goes on the final one here having to do with uh, mm -hmm. Father Lampert, who's a well-known exorcist, who talks about uh -huh. the fact that it's very important that, you know, there, it, there's no magic spell. Uh, the person has mm -hmm. to be wanting to get away from the devil. That, and, exactly. and that you need that relationship with Jesus. And one of the other uh, exorcists talks about the fact that the sacrament of confession, as you've always said, is so, so mm -hmm. important. It's the critical turning point. I mean, if you're not a Catholic and you've got this problem, um, you know, it's like Robbie Mannheim, uh, the priest, the Jesuits who are performing that exorcism, uh, basically tried to um, get Robbie uh, ultimately uh, to convert. I mean, he wanted to convert on his own, mm -hmm. but uh, trying to get him to take that profession of faith. Oh my gosh! I mean, the devil was just kicking and screaming and preventing him and mm -hmm. just uh, throwing him into one trance after the next. But he, ultimately, he did do it, and ultimately, he did make a confession. And when that happened, he, and he finally was able to take communion. Mm -hmm. That's when everything turned around. But he freely mm -hmm. wanted it. He freely accepted it. Once he did that and was resolved to follow through, uh, Satan had no, you know, he couldn't stop. St. Michael was right there present. And uh, he's the one that appears and says, you know, come out of the man, come out of him, uh, out, of, uh, out of him, right. and exit, exit, exit. Okay, very good. Let's move on to some uh, questions people sent in that tie right in. Uh, Dear Father Spitzer, some say Lucifer's last words were Psalm 8. Who is man that you are mindful of him? I just saw some pictures from the Webb telescope. Who is man that we are in his mind and that he sent his son to be one of us, Paul? Well, Paul, I can see how when you see those, uh, that data package uh, from the uh, web satellite, you could think, my gosh, this is just uh, unbelievable. It's beyond any kind of scale. I mean, here we are. We're literally reaching back to a mere 700,000 years after the Big Bang. I mean, we're, we're reaching back 13.1 billion years, and we're looking at the unfolding uh, of the universe in its, you know, cosmic symmetry and its elegance and its mathematical precision. And it's just a mind blower to look at that data package. No question about 
about it. You can see the hand of God everywhere. And Psalm 8, you know, is just blasting off the page. What is man that you should keep him in mind? Mortal man that you should care about him. You know, I mean, of course it's going to be uh, right there. But at the very same time, there is the answer from mm -hmm. Jesus Christ that you, first of all, we know from Genesis, you are made in the very image and likeness of God himself. So all that stuff we're seeing through the James Webb telescope and all of its beauty, immensity, elegance, precision, mathematical precision, everything, all of that stuff, it's a zero compared to you. You're the one that can do the math. You're the one that can understand hmm. the precision. You're the one that can love and return. You're the one that can see the beauty, the majesty, the elegance. You're the one who has the subjectivity. You're the one who has the, the mind and the heart, the reflection of, of God's own mind and heart right within you, made in the very image and likeness of God you are. You, uh, what is mortal man that you should care for him? Well, he made, he made us in, our, in his own image. And not only that, he redeemed us by the blood of his son. And so I would say, what is man? We are of infinite surpassing worth, each and every one of us, m worth much more than 20 of our universes unfolding, mm -hmm. each and every one of us. And that's why we should be treating each other with the utmost respect and the utmost dignity, because, of course, we are or not just more than 20 universes, not just more than a flock of sparrows, as it were, all natural images being, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, set aside. We are literally the image and likeness of God. We're looking right into the reflection of God's own image when we look at one another in our unique goodness, love, ability, and above all, in the transcendent soul that we are given with all its unique capacities and personality by God himself. So, oh, I would say, uh, right. what is a man that, we should, that you should care for him? Well, of course, he's got to care with infinite surpass, uh, surpassing uh, worth. Uh, he's got to care about you mm -hmm. uh, because just as he, he cares about his own son. Right. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, and of course, St. John says that explicitly in the priestly prayer of Christ um, in uh, John 17 in, in his own gospel. And so uh, I think at that point we should uh, be cognizant of just how much we're loved right. by God and just how much everybody else is loved by God, the respect we have to hold out for all of them, the love that is owed to all of them. Well, thank you so much for saying that, Father. We got a couple of minutes mm -hmm. just before the break. Okay. Uh, another similar question. Right. Dear Father Spencer, I've heard the expression, he sold his soul to the devil. This is usually in movies or books, but can a personally actual can a person actually sell his soul to the devil? Can a person irrevocably choose to do evil for some immediate gain, or do they always retain free will with the chance to repent? Cassie. Well, Kathy, you know, people can, first of all, say they're going to sell their soul to the devil, or the devil can approach them, right, like Faust, mm -hmm. and, and uh, in a literary character, right, and, and basically say, look, I want you to sell your soul to me. Mm -hmm. And a person can say, okay, if you give me this, 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 and this, then, ah, you got my soul, and uh, so forth. Now, you know, can you change your mind at the last minute? ever and always you can change your mind. Mm. Even if you do something of that consequence, of that stupidity, of that magnitude, even if you were to do it, I mean, it'd be hard to change your mind. Remember, the further down the path you go, mm. the more you accept the gifts of Satan, the harder it is to turn around. But you can, and you can call upon the Lord. You can go to the sacrament of reconciliation. You can start going to communion. You can start trying to follow the Lord's moral um, uh, 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 mm -hmm. will and, and moral teaching in our lives. And, and, and when we do that, uh, we can literally uh, turn the tide on Satan, and it's almost as if God himself in Goethe's uh, Faust, right, uh, mm -hmm. you know, when God uh, literally takes Faust right out of the hands of Mephistopheles. Okay. With that, we're going to take a break here. Father Spitzer, and uh, Doug Keck in his universe, and we have much more ahead. We have a couple more questions, then we'll get into the book. So stay with us here in Father Spitzer's universe.
everyone. Thank you so much for staying with us for part two of Father Spitzer's Universe. Satan customizes his temptations. Boy, does he. Uh, from Father's uh -huh. book, Christ vs. Satan in Our Daily Lives. And of course, let's talk to the man himself uh, and answer some of your questions that you've sent in to us. Dear Father Spitzer, my mother is a fallen away Catholic. She's 100 years old. God bless her. She was refused the she was refused the sacraments of anointing the sick by our priest when I requested it. Is it right, Arsenia? That sounds kind of odd. Wow! I, I, I refused it uh, like uh, for some substantive reason. I I've never heard of such a thing. I wouldn't think so either. Uh, I mean. I've, I've just never heard of some unless, such a thing. I, unless the, I, uh, was unless your the, mother, uh, yeah, uh, even though she was a fallen away Catholic, I mean, unless she has done something horribly egregious. What well, we're I saying, mean, I don't want chance. it or something, and saying, yeah. oh, I don't want it, then I guess maybe that can be. Yeah. Yeah, that, uh, yeah. If she doesn't want it, you you can't give it. Yeah, but can't uh, force it, just right. to refuse it out of hand, I've never heard of it. Yeah. So uh, very Sounds bizarre. A lot there, yeah. um, uh, I guess it's too, too late now to to get um, get another priest. Uh, another priest <laughs> right. in a hurry. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Here's another oh, question. Dear. I know that's kind of odd. Uh, dear Father Spitzer, it's becoming harder and harder to find videos and music on social media without some kind of foul language or vulgarity. I hesitate to even go on it anymore. Go to our on-demand page. There's lots of good stuff. Unfortunately, yeah. ma many of my family and friends do not see this as a problem. With such a communication and business conducted on social media, what should a Catholic do, a troubled viewer? Well, um, first of all, I mean, there's you just have to know what social media sites to get. Uh, good music from mm -hmm. uh, and I think right now we're um, under the constraint of having to uh, to be very selective and having to be very aware mm -hmm. of what we're filling our minds with I, I would say two things first of all I, I think your friends cavalier attitude is probably not very healthy mm -hmm. because what you put into your head day in day out constantly it begins to wear away at you and it gets into what's called your subconscious mind and as it gets into that subconscious uh, these images uh, whether they're violent images sexual images whatever uh, uncaring images whatever the images are that are being very suggestive uh, they're definitely going to have an effect on you mm -hmm. so that's one of the uh, the first things uh, to, to recognize the second thing um, to, to recognize is that uh, if you are selective you can find things that mm -hmm. really will counter uh, those kinds of uh, things that are happening Happening um, on the, um, uh, you know, on on the, uh, the other web, social, right. yeah, sure. uh, uh, you know, media and web mm -hmm. uh, uh, stations. So uh, you can actually find some things that are very, very positive. And uh, as you put it, Doug, EWTN has some great music mm -hmm. um, that you can get a hold of. There are all kinds of little classical playlists mm -hmm. that you can get, uh, movie playlists that you can get that are very good, um, you know, movie. Uh, uh, um, uh, right. You know, uh, uh, you know, productions, etc., that are really co great compositions uh, and uh, very, very good, uh, wonderful, peace-filled uh, and glory-filled um, uh, kinds of music. Right. Right. Unfortunately, it just takes a little more work than it used to in, in many cases. Yeah, that's right. You know, we can't rely on the culture in general to provide yeah. that. So. And that's for uh, sure. Here's another question uh, before we get to the book. Dear Father Spitzer, I've been told that a single Mass I pray well during my lifetime will be more beneficial to me than all the Masses said on my behalf after my death. Isn't every Mass worth the same as it is the sacrifice of our Lord's life, sufferings, and death, Terry? Well, Terry, I, I don't know where you heard that <laughs> expression right. from. I. I, I mean, I don't see how anybody could frankly make such a remark, I mean, without literally reading the mind, heart, and will of God, uh, you know, uh, and so uh, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Right. Uh, I, I just don't think that that, uh, that expression is worth anything. Um, so, uh, yes, of course, mm -hmm. I have very good masses here on earth, uh, but also have masses said for you uh, after you are deceased. Uh, and let God sort out uh, how much worth there is for all of that. But uh, preconditioning God uh, to such a statement is, uh, 
um, not uh, yeah. really worth the, 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 the time spent on uttering the statement. Okay, with that, let's move to the book, page 223, uh, How the Devil Works. You talk about the, the second group of, of people, as you describe them, uh, and, and the, they're subject to another dangerous rationalization. I notice one of the things you talk about mm -hmm. constantly is rationalizations going on, right? Yeah. Through everything. Yeah. But you say that they may be convinced that they are morally sound without God or religion. Now, that seems to be a very mm -hmm. popular perspective right now. Yeah, I mean, and the reason it's popular is because, first of all, you're not accountable to God. You're not accountable to a representative of God. You're not accountable to a moral uh, authority outside of yourself. And that's the first thing is, if we think that we can be completely authentic to ourselves and we don't have any accountability to any principle, to any set of commandments, to anything, all we got to do is sort of listen to ourselves and we haven't even formed our consciences aright and we think that this is going to be adequate, man, that is self-delusion at its best. Anybody can tell you, oh my gosh, I, I, I call it the, the principle of infinite Spitzerian rationalization. Mm -hmm. Give me five minutes and I can rationalize absolutely anything. I have to be held accountable. I have to be held accountable, accountable to principles that I, you know, that are like lines in not just the sand, but lines in the concrete. And I also have to be, you know, responsible to a God or to a moral agency that's outside of myself who's going to test me and push me, you know, so that I, I, you know, the authenticity will come out of me, even though sometimes I can already foresee that this is going to be a real, uh, inconvenience, shall we right. say, right. in my life uh, to be moral re morally responsible, or I don't want to be morally responsible because I want whatever pleasure or ego fulfillment or domination that this is is uh, going to promise, and I'm going to I want to go through with it and take it, you know, and so forth and so on. The accountability factor is huge. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is is if you think you can do this without religion, without God, without God's commandments, without a personal church on this earth to uh, be accountable to, my thought is, wow, better check the self-delusion box here <laughs> and uh, and the, uh, the, the, well, actually, the, the illusion box, first class, check that off. The second thing that, that really is uh, uh, very important, um, too, is it, when you think about it, is that uh, when people um, have nothing to be accountable to, that's when, as I said, the, 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 the principle of uh, infant Spitzerian rationalization comes into play because you'll look for anything you'll be casting about for any excuse to justify getting what you want and what you're not externally accountable uh, you know to uh, uh, to say no to so of course what winds up happening is you uh, rationalize it away and the devil of course uh, you know he can just sit there and say hey consider the following you know mm -hmm. uh, agreed is good and here's why you know and uh, whatever it may be you know the the uh, the, the various uh, principles of, or commandments you want to just, mm -hmm. uh, you know, overturn, he gives you those rationalizations. You know, you, you have no other counteracting influence. And right. that's why in the Parvatiya study, uh, it is very clear that people who have religious faith at the time of making an ethical decision are more likely, much more likely, uh, to do um, the moral ethical thing by that uh, re uh, religious standard than those mm -hmm. who do not have religious faith at right. the moment of decision. So there it is. Um, right. The You'll stats are out right. too. Yeah. Right. So is that also where we get these, well, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual, and also why you kind of get the Zen stuff that's out there as well, which is kind of yeah. like uh, an Americanized yeah. version of Buddhism, which takes away any of the obligations that mm -hmm. might be yeah. out there. Well, that's right. And, and of course, at first glance, you think to yourself, well, this is fantastic. I'm not responsible to anybody or anything. I can do whatever I can rationalize myself into. Now, you might think initially, well, that's a good thing. But mm -hmm. as your life gets out of control, 
Just remember, as you keep moving away from any kind of accountability to a moral order, and as you move away from being accountable to a God outside of yourself, the first thing is you're going to notice extreme rates of increase in depression, anxiety, suicides, suicidal ideation, in, uh, impulsivity, substance abuse, and of course, that's just the tip of the iceberg is the, is the complete shipwreck of emotional health in your life. Then the relational health is going to go. Your relationships are going to go down, down. This is proven by secular studies. This is not the Spitzerian uh, philosophy here. This is, this is secular studies that show the relational health goes down the drain. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you're married, the marital health is going to go down the drain. And finally, at the end of the day, you will feel the alienation. Mm -hmm. of not having anything of absolute significance, absolute meaning, absolute groundedness like God in your life. And that's what we call in, in philosophy, existential philosophy, dread. The dread is going to happen mm -hmm. because you're unmoored. Mm -hmm. You are groundless. You have no absolute. You have no meaning. You are literally floating in, 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 in a cosmos uh, of, for which you cannot get any groundedness or anchoredness. Uh, and, and of course, do you feel this as a sense of complete malaise and alienation, not only from God and from the world, but from yourself? Yes, this is a study after study study shows this to be the case. So, of course, what I'm talking about here is it's absurd mm -hmm. uh, to say uh, that, um, uh, that, that uh, you can just do this on your own and be spiritual. Mm -hmm. And even though you say up front, oh, this will be great, I can do whatever I want, just wait a few years down the pike. I'll tell you, hey, it's not going to be as great as you think. You're going to be very lonely, alienated, empty, filled with dread, filled with guilt, depression depression, anxiety, substance abuse, familial tensions, antisocial aggressivity, suicide, suicidal ideation, lucky you. Yeah. All I can tell you is it's not going to go well, even though the devil tells you it's going to be a dream. Mm -hmm. It's going to be great. He's telling you, a, his, 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 right. it's in nature. He is a liar, liar from and the he's beginning. telling you the, right. from the beginning. Right. And so, uh, well, I guess all I could tell you is if you want some really good secular studies that verify this, uh, in September I've got a new book coming out from Ignatius Press called The Moral Wisdom of the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. a defense of her controversial moral teachings. I have about 100 studies that validate this for the 10 big controversial moral issues, right. homosexual lifestyle, transgenderism, pornography, uh, birth control, artificial birth control and a variety of, mm -hmm. of other um, things, of course abortion, of course euthanasia, etc. Okay, very good. Uh, you also notice, uh, I notice on the bottom of this page on, on 223, you talk about, uh, I believe that the evil one frequently suggests to these individuals that we're talking about that have attained a high state of personal and ethical development without a strong commitment to God and religion, uh, that the idea that they don't take away the commitments that they have, but they say that those commit, he says those commitments are enough. That's all you need to do. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So you never have to follow through on it. You never have to worry uh, about, you know, as, as Jesus would say, vigilance, 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 perseverance, perseverance, perseverance. Why is Jesus constantly stressing perseverance? Because it's easy for us to get existentially bored. It's easy for us to sort of lose, uh, you know, interest, lose desire, lose heart. It's so easy for us uh, to sort of start letting go and letting go. Yeah, we made the commitment. We had the you know, our big surge, we had our fervorino, mm. our first fervor, and we went, you know, for the gold, and it's great. I think it's great. I mean, I did the same thing. Mm. When I came in college, when I really came to my religion and came to my own in my religion and even discovered my vocation there, etc., it was great. Oh, but you have to be vigilant. Mm. And there are many, many layers of depth. I mean, authenticity depth and, you know, and uh, uh, depth uh, to of soul. Of mm -hmm. depth of humility, depth of you know personal prayer and, and relationship with God. There's so much to do. There's so much to go. Now God's going to give us all the opportunity to do that. Uh, either
either in this life or the next, you know, when we go to purgatory, if we're on the road anyway, but why not do it now? Mm -hmm. Why not, you know, get it done as fa as much as you can? And, and of course, the first rule of, you know, that Jesus emphasizes, you've got to persevere, you've got to be vigilant, you've got to keep following through, you've got to keep the old desire enkindled, even if you're bored out of your mind, and even if you're losing interest, and you just think, I can't listen to another Spitzerian word, it'll kill me. The basic thing is, is well, don't listen to a Spitzerian word, listen to a Keck word, or listen to somebody else's word that you trust for spiritual uh, advice, because I'm mm -hmm. telling you at the end of the day, if you keep that heart going, and even, you know, you just go through the motions when sometimes you feel so emotionally detached, don't worry. You, you, you will come through it very purged, very, you know, transformed. Mm -hmm. It's worth everything. And so, you know, sometimes you go, well, you know, I'm not good enough to be going through a dark night of the soul. Maybe not, but maybe the mm -hmm. dark night of the senses a little bit. You could be going mm -hmm. through that, and it could have that boredom in it. And God is maybe right. purging you from, you know, just having those everyday sorts of consolation from him. But the main thing to remember is that um, uh, as you're being purged, you're being purified. Right. Your authenticity is deepening. Your humility is deepening. It's, uh, it's really happening. And therefore, your love is being purified. And your ego is not going to get in the way of your love. Your domination and sensuality will not get in the way of your love as strongly as it did before. So it's worth everything you put into it. Persevere, right. follow through, well, you talk keep about, going even if it's right. just the Perseverance motions. and work, like you say. You talk about, mm -hmm. uh, in a sense, spiritual sloth fits in here and it's dangerous yeah. uh, because yeah. people lose, uh, you know, the goal of their ultimate purpose in life. You go, go on to say, and I was wondering, mm -hmm. use this phrase, about somebody underliving one's life. Have you known anybody who yeah. was like that? <laughs> well, well, first of all, St. Augustine, but I was one of the people <laughs> myself. I, I have to uh, say that for a long while there, I, uh, I mean, I, I, I never really lost contact with the church and mm -hmm. everything, uh, but I surely had uh, in my um, later high school and early collegiate days, let's just say my, uh, my um, uh, more carefree Mm -hmm. uh, moments that were not, uh, they were destructively carefree in my view, but mm -hmm. luckily I started going to daily mass. And that's what saved me in college. And then having the group of friends I had, and I'll mm -hmm. give them a shout out, boy, I'll tell you, I, I'm, I still am gonna meet with them in September. I meet with them every year. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, but that group of friends who was so interested in God maintained their faith, and mm -hmm. you know, that was a good, another really God-given gift that was given to me. And then finally, of course, having those um, you know, metaphysics classes, finding the singularity proofs, having the kind of the rational stuff that got put into being. Uh, God really led me uh, right, to, right into uh, uh, the Society of Jesus, led me right into my vocation. Okay. But um, yeah, yeah, I was definitely doing a, a definite underlive. <laughs> I mean, uh, to say the least. Moving <laughs> on to the to the next group, uh, the third group, which is the striving towards strong religious and moral conversion. Mm -hmm. These people are kind of like the next level mm -hmm. up. You say this group is committed yeah. to God and interior moral conversion, but they need to be vigilant about actualizing their moral conversion in the world. What do you mean by that? Yeah, well, what happens is, you know, uh, when you sort of get stronger and stronger in your faith and, you, you, you know, you say, well, I've got intellectual conversion, but that's not enough. I've got spiritual conversion, right? I'm going to Mass. Uh, maybe even during the weekdays, I'm going to reconciliation four, five, six, seven times a year, you know, or more, you know, and, and I'm, I'm doing, you know, things that I, uh, uh, you know, I think are, you know, I'm really committed to mm. following the Lord's 
teaching in, in moral areas. But then, you know, um, when push comes to shove, you know, the, the rationalizations start coming in and a kind of a lethargy about, mm -hmm. well, I can watch this kind of movie. It's never going to harm me, you know, or I can go to this uh, uh, kind of an event mm -hmm. and it's not really going to harm me, you know, or I can just keep going with uh, these two friends. I mean, I mean, after all, I'm just keeping in contact mm -hmm. with them. And, and, you know, it's just not really going to harm me, uh, you know, if I, uh, you know, uh, kind of try to get the best house, the best car, you know, beat all my friends and show them who mm -hmm. I really am mm -hmm. and dominate the people around me. I mean, these are just like subjective things. They're not really wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm just, I am better after all. So <laughs> I, I mean, I deserve it. I owe it to myself. Right. So, I mean, I, 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 you know, I should do it. So, I mean, all these things, you know, are, are there present, you know, um, and it's, it starts weakening us. And that's why we have to not buy the baloney. Uh, you know, we, we, we can't just, you know, submit to uh, sort of that kind of easy rationalization mm -hmm. that, you know, um, being vain, eh, it's a victimless sin, mm -hmm. you know, being proud, I should be proud, I am better than people. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just acknowledging the truth, yeah. right? Greed is good. I mean, what's so bad about having a few little indulgences here and there? I mean, I don't have to stop at the 20th house and the, uh, the 20th car. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I mean, what the heck, you know, God, you know, creaturely things right. are good. You know, and so it, these are the rationalizations, I would say, that are very, right. very easy even for a person who's really committed to the moral life, you know, that's how the evil spirit gets you. He's not going to say, oh, have a relationship with someone who's not your wife. Mm. Or, oh, um, you know, it's okay if you miss a ton of masses and never go to confession. Or, oh, uh, it's okay for you to uh, tell a monstrous lie which will harm somebody's reputation. Mm. Or, oh, uh, he's, he's not going to do the obvious right. ones, right? right. He's, he's going to do the ones where, you know, he thinks he can kind of get you to say, eh, it's mm -hmm. a fudge area. Here, right. yep. And so but when he, you uh, say here, the he evil, pushes that button. The evil one can take people like this by surprise. And you go on to say, yeah. as it, to just fit what you were saying, he's a master presenting these temptations subtly. Yeah, that's right. So he basically, uh, I mean, it's uh, you know all the the the, the people uh, that you see in these movie characters, you know, mm -hmm. Al Pacino and that uh, Devil's Advocate. Mm -hmm. You know, he starts with. Hey, there's nothing wrong. You are the best lawyer. <clears throat> you know, what the heck? You might as well, you know, go ahead and, you know, uh, accept a little help from me. Mm -hmm. You know, and then, uh, 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 you know, Gordon Gekko, uh, uh, that was, uh, I guess, uh, was that... Uh, who was playing anyway in Wall Street? Uh, that uh, uh, you know the the, Michael the, the Douglas. Wall Street. Uh, yeah, Michael yeah. Douglas. yeah. So you know it's uh, yeah it's okay you know bud you know it's just you're just going in there. I mean he's the one who's being careless about mm -hmm. laying out company secrets in a place that you can get them by just being on the custodial staff. Mm -hmm. And of course you know he buys that rationalization. Mm -hmm. But I mean so yeah even you know, now of course it's no longer subtle at that point mm -hmm. but when gecko starts off he's exceedingly subtle right, right. he just says hey you know you, you sport you owe it to yourself get yourself a penthouse there in the middle of manhattan and you know uh, i got just the one you know and hey you know you need a kind of high-end girlfriend mm -hmm. and here's darian you know she's you know, go, go ahead and you know you know she's the one for you mm -hmm. you know and of course why not you know i I am that good, you know, and so he, he creates a myth around you, gives you false successes and false consolations, and you start buying his myth, and then the next thing you know, right. you're into it, and your father's company's going to be killed. Right, he sets so, you up. I mean, right, yep, exactly. He sets you up. And you say here, uh, I thought there was an interesting, he will, sub, uh, the, if uh, the person submits a temptation, if he does, the evil one will follow rapidly with false consolations and other rationalizations to cushion his fall and minimize his yeah. perception of its effect. Yeah, exactly. So the first thing is, is, you know, the devil doesn't play the accuser until you regret it. 
So the first thing the devil's going to do, right, is after you've fallen and you've done some more, of course he's going to say, hey, you know, you couldn't help it. I mean, you know, that was a beautiful woman. Mm. Or, hey, you, you couldn't help it. You know, I mean, uh, uh, you know, the, this thing fell out, you know, over here. And, and uh, well, you, you, you just earned a, a huge uh, uh, pot of money there, you know, and uh, it's a windfall. Mm -hmm. You know, don't worry about it. And so the, the idea would be is, of course, he's going to try and cushion you. Of course, he's going to give you false consolations. He does not want you to regret anything. And he's going to give you every excuse under the sun to regret it. But if you go, oh, my gosh, what have I done? Uh, you know, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I hurt the Lord. I can't mm. believe I hurt you, my Lord. I'm sorry. Oh, then he comes <laughs> after you. Change of tune. Mm. Then, of course, well, you're a little wretch anyway, mm. and this is what kind of thing you always do. Mm. And, of course, he becomes the accuser. Mm. And, of course, God is disgusted with you. God's not disgusted with you, of course. But, of course, he's going to tell you that God is so mad at you right now, there's no way you can possibly turn to him. And for what, never think about going to confession. Mm. Because, after all, you know, I mean, that uh, he, he's not going to forgive you anyway, and so forth and so on. And so you really have, uh, right. you know, this Absolutely. terrible mm -hmm, sort Absolutely. of uh, guilt uh, trip. Mm -hmm. That's right. And it's, unfortunately, we are out of time, and people are going to have to join us again oh. next time to get some more insights. Father, if you'll give us your blessing on Absolutely. the way out the door. And bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. And may the Lord, who truly is love and mercy, the Lord who does lead, guide, and protect us, give you the strength to follow him. Give you the strength to persevere. Give you the desire to follow him. And, and, and so when you acquiesce and do follow that desire, you will find yourself not only moving in the pathway to salvation, but leading many others to do so. You may find your true meaning and purpose in life through him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Father Spitzer. Be well. Enjoy the conference. I'm Doug Keck. Remember that Father Spitzer's books are available in EWTN's religious catalog. Next week, we'll be answering your questions. We've got a whole mailbag that we'll be running through. And we've also got an EWTN bookmark I did, Jesus, I Trust in You, a 30-day personal retreat with the Litany of Trust by Sister Faustina Maria Pia. It's an excellent, excellent book. And be sure to check out The Word on the Word. Melissa and Va Veronica, two of our great employees here, you can see them there, they give great insights each week on the Mass readings for Sunday. Be sure to catch them on our Facebook, Instagram, YouTube every Wednesday. You won't regret it. And we'll see you next time right here in Father Spitzer's Universe. Thanks.